Chapter One of Kabumpo in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schneider. Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. Chapter One: The Exploding Birthday Cake. The cake, you chattering chittymong, where is the cake? Stirrum, Fryum, Hesham, where is the cake? cried Ichabo, chief footman in the palace of Pumperdink, bouncing into the royal pantry. The three cooks, too astonished for speech, and with staring eyes, pointed at the center table. The great gorgeous birthday cake was gone, though not two seconds before it had been placed on the table by hashem himself it was my m -m -m masterpiece sobbed hashem tearing off his cap and throwing his apron over his head help robbers thieves cried sturm and fryum running to the window here was a howdy do the trumpets blowing for the celebration to begin and the best part of the celebration gone we'll all be dipped for this wailed ejabo flinging open the second best china closet so violently that three silver cups and a pewter mug tumbled out just then there was a scream from hashem who had removed the apron from his head look he shrieked there it is Back to the table rushed the other three, Sturm and Fryam rubbing their eyes, and Ejabo, his head where the cups had bumped him severely. Upon the table stood the royal cake, as pink and perfect as ever. "'It was there all the time, mince my eyebrows,' sputtered Hashem in an injured voice. "'Called me a chittymong, did you?' Grasping a big wooden spoon, he ran angrily at Ejabo. Was it gone, or wasn't it? cried Ejabo, appealing to the others, and hastily catching up a bread knife to defend himself. Instantly there arose a babble. It was, it wasn't, was, rap, bang, clatter. In a minute they were in a furious argument, not only with words, but with spoons, forks, and bowls. And dear knows what would have become of the cake had not a bell rung loudly and the second footman poked his head through the door. "'The cake! Where is the cake?' he wheezed importantly. So Ejabo, dodging three cups in a salt cellar, seized the great silver platter and dashed into the great banquet hall. One pink coat was missing, and his wig was somewhat elevated over the left ear from the lump raised by the pewter mug, but he summoned what dignity he could, and joined the grand procession of footmen who were bearing gold and silver dishes filled with goodies for the birthday feast of prince pompadour of pumperdink the royal guests were already assembled and just as ejabo entered the pages blew a shrill blast upon their silver trumpets and the prime pumper stepped forward to announce their majesties Oi zay, oi zay, shouted the prime pumper, pounding on the floor with his silver staff, while the guests politely inclined their heads, just as if they had not heard the same announcement dozens of times before. Oi zay, oi zay, Pompous the Proud and Posy Pink, King and Queen of Pumperdink, way for the king and clear the floor, way for our good prince Pompadour way for the elegant elephant way for the king and queen and the prince i say so everybody weighed which is to say they bowed and down the centre of the room swept pompous very fat and gorgeous in his purple robes and jeweled crown and posy pink very stately and queen-like in her ermine cloak and prince pompadour very straight and handsome in fact they looked exactly as a good old-fashioned royal family should. But Kabumpo, who swayed along grandly after the prince, few royal families could boast of so royal and elegant an elephant. 
he was huge and gray on his head he wore jeweled bands and a jeweled court robe billowed out majestically as he walked his little eyes twinkled merrily and his big ears flapped so sociably that just to look at him put one in a good humor kabumpo was the only elephant in pumperdink or in any kingdom near pumperdink so no wonder he was a prime favorite at court he had been given to the king at pompous christening by a friendly stranger and since then had enjoyed every luxury and advantage he was not only treated as a member of the royal family but was always addressed as sir by all of the palace servants he lends an air of elegance to our court the king was fond of saying and the elegant elephant he surely had become now an elegant elephant at court might seem strange in a regular up-to-date country but pumperdink is not at all regular nor up-to-date it is a cozy old-fashioned kingdom way up in the northern part of the gillikin country of oz old-fashioned enough to wear knee breeches and have a king and cozy enough to still enjoy birthday parties and candy pulls if pompous the king was a bit proud who could blame him his queen was the loveliest his son the most charming and his elephant the most elegant and unusual for twenty kingdoms round about and pompous for all his pride had a very simple way of ruling when the pumperdinkians did right they were rewarded when they did wrong they were dipped in the very center of the courtyard there is a great stone well with a huge stone bucket into this pumperdink well all offenders and lawbreakers were lowered its waters were dark blue and as the color stuck to one for several days the inhabitants of pumperdink were careful to behave well so that the chief dipper who turned the wheel that raised and lowered the bucket often had days at a time with nothing to do this time he spent in writing poetry and as prince pompadour took the place of honor at the head of the table the chief dipper rose from his humble place at the foot and with a moist flourish burst forth o oh, pompadour of pumperdink of all perfection you're the pink your praises now i utter your eyes are clear as applesauce your head the best i've come across your heart is soft as butter very good said the king and the chief dipper sat down blushing with pride and confusion prince pompadour bowed and the rest of the party clapped tremendously sounds like a dipper full of nonsense to me wheezed kabumpo who stood directly back of prince pompadour's throne leisurely consuming a bale of hay placed on the floor beside him it may surprise you to know that all the animals in oz can talk but such is the case and pumperdink being in the fairy country of oz kabumpo could talk as well as any man and better than most eyes like applesauce heart of butter <laughs> the elegant elephant laughed so hard he shook all over then slyly reaching over the prince pumper's shoulder he snatched his glass of pink lemonade and emptied it down his great throat setting the tumbler back before the old fellow turned his head did you call sir asked ijabo hurrying over he had mistaken kabumpo's laugh for a command yes why did you not give his excellency lemonade demanded the elegant elephant sternly i did he must have drunk it sir stuttered ijabo drunk it cried the prime pumper pounding on the table indignantly i never had any fetch him a glass at once rumbled kabumpo waving his trunk and ijabo too wise to argue with a member of the royal family brought another glass of lemonade but no sooner had he done so than the mischievous elephant stole that next the prime pumper's plate and roll and all so quickly no one but prince pompadour knew what was happening and poor ijabo was kept running backwards and forwards till his wig stood on end with confusion and rage all of this was very amusing to the prince 
and helped him to listen pleasantly to the fifteen long birthday speeches addressed to him by members of the royal guard but if the speeches were dull the dinner was not the fiddlers fiddled so merrily and the chief cook hashem had so outdone himself in the preparation of new and delicious dainties that by ice cream and cake time every one was in a high good humor the cake my good ejabo fetch forth the cake commanded king pompous beaming proudly upon his son nervously ejabo stepped to the side table and lighted the eighteen tall birthday candles a cake that had disappeared once might easily do so again and ejabo was anxious to have it cut and out of the way out of his way at least hashem looking through a tiny crack in the door almost burst with pride as his gorgeous pink masterpiece was set down before the king many happy returns of your eighteenth birthday cried the courtiers jumping to their feet and waving their napkins enthusiastically <laughs> thank you thank you chuckled pompadour bowing low i feel that this is but one of many more to come which may sound strange but pumperdink being in oz one may have as many eighteenth birthdays as one cares to have this was pompous tenth and while the courtiers drank his health the prince made ready to blow out the birthday candles that's right blow em all out at once cried the king so pompa puffed out his cheeks and blew with all his might but not a candle flickered then he tried again indeed he puffed and blew until he was a regular royal purple but nary a candle flame so much as wavered stubbornest candles i ever saw blustered king pompous then he puffed out his cheeks and blew like a porpoise so did queen posy and the prime pumper so did everybody they blew until every dish upon the table skipped and they all sank back exhausted in their chairs but the candles burned as merrily as ever then kabumpo took a hand or rather a trunk he had been watching the proceedings with his twinkling little eyes now he took a tremendous breath pointed his trunk straight at the cake and blew with all his strength every candle went out but stars as they did the great pink cake exploded with such force that half the courtiers were flung under the table and the rest knocked unconscious by flying fragments of icing tumblers and plates treason screamed pompous the first to recover from the shock who dared put gunpowder in the cake brushing the icing from his nose he glared around angrily the first person to catch his eye was hashem the cook who stood trembling in the doorway dip him shouted the king furiously and the chief dipper only too glad of an excuse to escape seized poor hashem and him ordered the king as ejabo tried to sidle out of the room and them as all the other footmen started to run forming his victims in a line the chief dipper marched them sternly from the banquet hall i say i say everybody shall be dipped mumbled the prime pumper feebly raising his head oh no oh no nothing of the sort snapped the king fanning poor queen posy pink with the plate she had fainted dead away what is the meaning of this outrage shouted pompous his anger rising again how should i know wheezed kabumpo dragging prince pompadour from beneath the table and pouring a jug of cream over his head something hit me moaned the prince opening his eyes of course it did said kabumpo the cake hit you made a great hit with us all that cake the elegant elephant looked ruefully at his silk robe of state which was hopelessly smeared with icing then put his trunk to his head for something hard had struck him between the eyes he felt about the floor and found a round shiny object which he was about to show the king when pompous pounced upon a tall scroll sitting upright in his tumbler 
In the confusion of the moment, it had escaped his attention. "'Perhaps this will explain,' spluttered the king, breaking the seal. Queen Posy Pink opened her eyes with a sigh, and the courtiers, crawling out from beneath the table, looked up anxiously, for everyone was still dazed from the tremendous explosion. Pompous read the scroll to himself with popping eyes, and then began to dance up and down in a frenzy. "'What is it? What is it?' cried the queen, trying to read over his shoulder. Then she gave a well-bred scream and fainted away in the arms of General Quakes, who had come up behind her. By this time the prime pumper had recovered sufficiently to remember that reading scrolls and court papers was his business. Somewhat unsteadily he walked over and took the scroll from the king. "'Oi, say, oi, say, he faltered, pounding on the table. "'Oh, never mind that,' rumbled Kabumpo, flagging his ears. "'Let's hear what it says.' <clears throat> "'No, ye,' began the old man in a high, shaky voice, "'know ye that unless ye, prince of ye ancient and honorable kingdom of Pumperdink, wed ye proper fairy princess in ye proper span of time, ye kingdom of Pumperdink shall disappear for ever, and even longer, from ye Gillikin country of Oz. J. G. "'What?' screamed Pompadour, bounding to his feet. "'Me? But I don't want to marry.' "'You'll have to,' groaned the king with a wave at the scroll. The courtiers sat staring at one another in dazed disbelief. From the courtyard came the splash and splutter of the luckless footman and the dismal creaking of the stone bucket. "'Oh!' wailed Pompa, throwing up his hands. "'This is the worst eighteenth birthday I've ever had. I'll never have another as long as I live.'" End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plummy Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Picking a Proper Princess. What shall we do first? groaned the king, holding his head with both hands. Let me think. Right, said Kabumpo. Think by all means. So the great hall was cleared and the king, with the mysterious scroll spread out before him, thought and thought and thought. But he did not make much headway, for, as he explained over and over to Queen Posy, who, with Pompadour, the elegant elephant, and the prime pumper, had remained to help him, how is one to know where to find the proper princess, and how is one to know the proper time for Pompa to wed her? Who was J. G.? How did the scroll get in the cake? The more the king thought about these questions, the more wrinkled his forehead became. Why, we're liable to wake up any morning and find ourselves gone, he announced gloomily. How does it feel to disappear, I wonder? I suppose it would give one rather a gone feeling, but I don't believe it would hurt much volunteered Kabumpo, glancing uneasily over his shoulder. "'Perhaps not, but it would not get us anywhere. My idea is to marry the prince at once to a proper princess,' put in the prime pumper, "'and avoid all this disappearing.' "'You're in a great hurry to marry me off, aren't you?' said Pompadour sulkily. "'For my part, I don't want to marry at all.' "'Well, that's very selfish of you, Pompa said the king in a grieved voice. Do you want your poor old father to disappear? Not only your poor old father, choked the prime pumper, rolling up his eyes. How about me? Oh, you, you can disappear any time you want, said the prince unfeelingly. It all started with that wretched cake, sighed the queen. I am positive the scroll flew out of the cake when it exploded. Of course it did cried Pompus. Let us send for the cook and question him. So Hashem, very wet and blue from his dip, was brought before the king. 
A fine cook you are, roared Pompus, mixing gunpowder and scrolls in a birthday cake. But I didn't, wailed Hashem, falling on his knees. Only eggs, your highness, the very best eggs, sugar, flour, spice, and bombshells, cried the king angrily. The cake disappeared before the party, your majesty, cried Ijibo. Everyone jumped at the sudden interruption, and Ijibo, who had crept in unnoticed, stepped before the throne. Disappeared, continued Ijibo hoarsely, dripping blue water all over the royal rugs. One minute there it was on the pantry table, next minute, gone, croaked Ijibo, flinging up his hands and shrugging his shoulders. Then, before a fellow could turn around, it was back. Toward our fault if magic got mixed into it, and here we have been dipped for nothing. Well, why didn't you say so before? asked the king in exasperation. Fine chance I had to say anything, sniffed Ijibo, wringing out his lace ruffles. Er, uh, uh, you may have the day off, my good man, said Pompus with an apologetic cough. And you also, with a wave at Hashem. Very stiffly the two walked to the door. It's an off day for us, all right, said Ijibo ungraciously. And without so much as a bow, the two disappeared. I fear you are a bit hasty, my love, murmured Queen Posy, looking after them with a troubled little frown. Well, who wouldn't be? cried Pompus, ruffling up his hair. Here we are liable to disappear any minute, and all you do is stand around and criticize me. Be gone, he puffed angrily as a page stuck his head in the door. No you shouting at people to be gone, said the elegant elephant testily. We'll all be gone soon enough. At this, Queen Posy began to weep into her silk handkerchief, which sight so affected Prince Pompadour that he rushed forward and embraced her tenderly. "'I'll marry,' cried the prince impulsively. "'I'll do anything. The trouble is there aren't any fairy princesses around here.' "'There must be,' said the king. "'There is, there is,' screamed the prime pumper, bouncing up suddenly. Oize, oize, has your majesty forgotten Faliro, royal princess of Fallensby Forest? Why, of course, the king snapped his fingers joyfully. Everyone says Faliro is a fairy princess. She must be the proper one. Faliro, trumpeted the elegant elephant, sitting down with a terrific thud. That awful old creature? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Silence, thundered the king. Nonsense, trumpeted Kabumpo. She's a thousand years old and as ugly as a stone Lukogu. Don't you marry her, Pompa. I command you to marry her, cried the king, opening his eyes very wide and bending forward. Faliro, gasped the prince, scarcely believing his ears. No wonder Pompadour was shocked. Faliro, although a princess in her own right and of royal fairy descent, was so unattractive that in all her thousand years of life no one had wished to marry her. She lived in a small hut in the great forest kingdom next to Pumperdink, and did nothing all day but gather faggots. Her face was long and lean, her hair thin and black, and her nose so large that it made you think of a cauliflower. Ugh, groaned Prince Pompadour, falling back on Kabumpo for support. Well, she's a princess and a fairy, the only one in any kingdom. I don't see why you want to be so fussy, said the king fretfully. Shall I tell Her Royal Highness of the great good fortune that has befallen her? asked the prime pumper, starting for the door. Do so at once, snapped Pompus. Just then he gave a scream of fright and pain, for a round, shiny object had flown through the air and struck him on the head. What was that? The prime pumper looked suspiciously at the elegant elephant. Kabumpo glared back. A, a warning, stuttered the prime pumper, afraid to say that Kalumpo had flung the offending missile. A warning, your majesty. 
It's nothing of the kind, said the king angrily. You're getting old, Pumper, and stupid. It's, why, it's a doorknob. Who dares to hit me with a doorknob? It hit me once, mumbled Kabumpo, shifting uneasily from one foot to the other three. How does it strike you? As an outrageous piece of impertinence, sputtered Pompus, turning as red as a turkey cock. Perhaps it has something to do with the scroll, suggested Queen Posy, taking it from the king. See, it is gold, and all the doorknobs in the palace are ivory. And look, here are some initials. Sure enough, it was gold, and in the very center were the initials P.A. Just at this interesting juncture, the page, who had been poking his head in the door every few minutes, gathered his courage together and rushed up to the king. Pardon, most high highness, but General Quakes bade me say that this mirror was found under the window, started the page, and before Pompus had an opportunity to cry, be gone or dip him, the little fellow made a dash for the door and disappeared. It grows more puzzling every minute, wailed the king, looking from the doorknob to the mirror and from the mirror to the scroll. If you take my advice, you'll have this marriage performed at once, said the prime pumper in a trembling voice. I believe I will, sighed Pompus, rubbing the bump on his head. Go and fetch the princess Faliro, and you, Pompa, prepare for your wedding. But, father, began the prince, not another word or you'll be dipped, rumbled the king of Pumperdink. I'm not going to have my kingdom disappearing if I can help it. You mean, if I can help it, muttered Pompadour gloomily. This is ridiculous, stormed the elegant elephant, as the prime pumper rushed importantly out of the room. Don't you know that this country of ours is only a small part of the great kingdom of Oz? There must be hundreds of princesses for Pompadour to choose from. Why should he not wed Ozma, the princess of us all? Haven't you read any Oz history? Have you never heard of the wonderful Emerald City? Let Pompadour start out at once. I myself will accompany him. And if Ozma refuses to marry him, well... The elegant elephant drew himself up. I will carry her off, that's all. It's a long way to the Emerald City, mused Queen Posy, but still... Yes, and what is to become of us in the meantime, pray... While you are wandering all over Oz, we can disappear, I suppose. No, sir, not one step do you go out of Pumperdink. Faliro is the proper princess, and Pompadour shall marry her, said Pompus. You're talking through your crown, wheezed Kalumpo. How about the doorknob and mirror? They came out of the cake as well as the scroll. What are you going to do about them? Let's have a look at the mirror. Just a common gold mirror, fumed Pompus, holding it up for the elegant elephant to see. What's the matter? As Kalumpo gave a snort. On the face of the mirror, as Kalumpo looked in, two words appeared. Elegant elephant. And when Pompus snatched the mirror, above his reflection stood the words, Fat old king. Then Queen Posy peeped into the mirror, which promptly flashed, Lovely Queen. Why, it's telling the truth, screamed Pompa, looking over his mother's shoulder. At this, the words Charming Prince formed quickly in the glass. The prince grinned at his father, who was now quite beside himself with rage. You think I'm fat and old, do you? snorted the king, flinging the gold mirror face down on the table. This is a nice day, I must say. Scrolls, doorknobs, mirrors, and insults. But what can P.A. stand for? mused Queen Posy thoughtfully. <laughs> Plain enough, chuckled Kabumpo maliciously. It stands for perfectly awful. Who's perfectly awful? asked Pompus suspiciously. Why, Faliro, sniffed the elegant elephant. That's plain enough to everybody. Dip him, shrieked Pompus. I've had enough of this. Dip him, do you hear? That, yawned Kabumpo, 
straightening his silk robe, is impossible. And considering his size, it was. But just that minute, the prime pumper returned, and in his interest to hear what the princess Filiro had said, the king forgot about dipping Kabumpo. The courtier from the princess stepped forward. Her Highness, puffed the prime pumper, who had run all the way, her Highness accepts Prince Pompadour with pleasure and will marry him tomorrow morning. Prince Pompadour gave a dismal groan. Fine, cried the king, rubbing his hands together. Let everything be made ready for the ceremony, and in the meantime, Pompus glared about him fiercely, I forbid any one's disappearing. I am still the king. Set a guard around the castle, Pumper, to watch for any signs of disappearance. And if so much as a fence paling disappears, he drew himself up. Notify me at once. Then turning to the throne, Pompus gave his arm to Queen Posy, and together they started for the garden. Do you mean to say you are going to pay no attention to the mirror or doorknob? cried Kabumpo, planting himself in the king's path. Go away, said Pompus crossly. Oise, oise, way for their majesties, cried the prime pumper, running ahead with his silver staff, and the royal couple swept out of the banquet hall. Never mind, Kabumpo, said the prince, flinging his arm affectionately around the elegant elephant's trunk. I dare say Filiro has her good points, and we cannot let the old kingdom disappear, you know. Fiddlesticks, choked Kabumpo. She'll make a doormat of you, Pompa. Prince Pompa doormat. That's what you'll be. Let's run away, he proposed, his little eyes twinkling anxiously. I couldn't do that and let the kingdom disappear. It wouldn't be right, sighed the prince and sadly he followed his parents into the royal gardens. "'The king's a gooch,' gulped the elegant elephant unhappily. Then, all at once, he flung up his trunk. "'Somebody's going to disappear around here,' he wheezed darkly. "'That's certain.' With a mighty rustling of his silk robe, Kabumpo hurried off to his own royal quarters in the palace. Left alone, Prince Pompa threw himself down at the foot of the throne and gazed sadly into space. End of chapter 2Kabumpo and Pompa disappear. Once in his own apartment, Kabumpo pulled the bell rope furiously. My pearls and my purple plush robe, bring them at once, he puffed when his personal attendant appeared in the doorway. Yes, sir, are you going out, sir? murmured the little Pumperdickian, hastening to a great chest in the corner of the big marble room to get out the robe. "'Not unless disappearing is going out,' said Kabumpo, more mildly, for he was quite fond of this little man who waited on him. "'But I am liable to disappear any minute. So are you. So is everybody. And I, for my part, wish to do the thing well and disappear with as much elegance as possible. Have you heard about the magic scroll, Spiesel? "'Yes, sir.' quavered Spiesel, mounting a ladder to adjust the elegant elephant's pearls and gorgeous robe of state. Yes, sir, and my head's going round and round like... Like what? asked Kabumpo, looking approvingly at his reflection in the long mirror. I can't rightly say, sir, sighed Spiesel. This disappearing has me that mixed up I don't know what I'm doing. Well, don't start by losing your head, chuckled Kabumpo. There. That will do very well. He lifted the little man down from the ladder. Goodbye, Spiesel. If you should disappear before I should see you again, try to do it in style. Yes, sir, gulped Spiesel. Then, taking out a bright red handkerchief, he blew his nose violently and rushed out of the room. 
Kabumpo walked up and down before the mirror, surveying himself from all angles. A very gorgeous appearance he presented in his purple plush robe of state, all embroidered in silver, and his headbands of shining pearls. In the left side of his robe there was a deep pocket. Into this the elegant elephant slipped all the jewels he possessed, taking them from a drawer in the chest. "'I must get that gold doorknob,' he rumbled thoughtfully, "'and the mirror.' Noiselessly, for all his tremendous size, Kabumpo could move without a sound. He made his way back to the banquet hall and loomed up suddenly behind the prime pumper. The old fellow was staring with popping eyes into the gold mirror. "'Ho, ho! Crump!' no wonder above the shocked reflection of the foolish statement stood the words old goose a truthful mirror indeed wheezed the elegant elephant hey what stuttered the prime pupper slapping the mirror down on the table in a hurry where'd you come from what are you all dressed up for for my disappearance said kabumpo sweeping the doorknob and mirror into his pocket I'm getting ready to disappear. How do I look? Before the prime pumper had time to answer, the elegant elephant was gone. Back in his own room, Kabumpo paced impatiently up and down, waiting for night. I do not see how she could refuse us, he mumbled every now and then to himself. That was an anxious afternoon and evening in the palace of Pumperdink. Every few minutes the courtiers felt themselves nervously to see if they were still there. The servants went about on tiptoe, looking fearfully over their shoulders for the first signs of disappearance. As it grew darker, the gates and windows were securely barred, and not a candle was lighted. "'The less the candle shows, the less likely it is to disappear,' reasoned the king. The darkness suited Kabumpo. He waited until everyone in the palace had retired, and a full hour longer. Then he stepped softly down the passage to the prince's apartment. Pompadour, without undressing, had flung himself upon a couch and fallen into an uneasy slumber. Without making a sound, Kabumpo took the prince's crown from a dressing cabinet, slipped it carefully into the pocket of his robe, and then carefully lifted the sleeping prince in his curling trunk and started cautiously down the great hall setting him gently on the floor as he reached the palace doors he pushed back the golden bolts and stepped out into the garden the voices of the watchmen calling to each other from the great wall came faintly through the darkness but the elegant elephant hurried to a secret unguarded entrance known only to himself and pompadour and passed like a great shadow through the swinging gates once outside he swung the sleeping prince to his broad back and ran swiftly and silently through the night what are we doing murmured the prince drowsily in his sleep <laughs> disappearing chuckled kabumpo under his breath disappearing from pumperdink my lad end of chapter three chapter four of kabumpo in oz by ruth plummy thompson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the curious cottabus appears ouch prince pompadour stirred uneasily and rolled over ouch he groaned again giving his pillow a fretful thump ouch this time his eyes flew open for his knuckles were tingling with pain a rock gasped the prince sitting up indignantly a rock under my head no wonder it aches great gillikins where am i he stared about wildly there was not a familiar object in sight indeed he was in a dim deep forest and from the distance came the sound of someone sawing wood 
Oh, oh, I know, muttered the prince, rubbing his head miserably. It's that wretched scroll. I've disappeared, and this is the place I've disappeared to. Stiffly, he got to his feet and started to walk in the direction of the sawing, but had only gone a few steps before he gave a great cry of joy, for there, leaning up against a tree, snoring like twenty woodcutters at work, was Kabumpo. "'Wake up!' cried Pompadour, pounding him with all his might. "'Wake up, Kabumpo! We've disappeared!' "'Oh, have we?' yawned the elegant elephant, opening one eye. "'You don't say. Ha, ho, hum!' With a tremendous yawn, he opened the other eye and began to chuckle and shake all over. <laughs> we stole a march on em, Pompa. I'd like to see the king's face when he finds us gone. Old Pumper will be ozaying all over the palace. He'll think we've disappeared by magic. Well, didn't we? asked Pompadour in amazement. Not unless you call me magic. I carried you off in the night. Do you suppose old Kabumpo was going to stand quietly by while they married you to a faggoty old fairy like Faliro? Not much, wheezed the elegant elephant. I have other plans for you, little one. But this is terrible, cried the prince, catching hold of a tree. Have you left my poor old father, my lovely mother, and the whole kingdom of Pumperdink to disappear? We'll have to go straight back, right straight back to Pumperdink, do you hear? Do have a little sense. Kabumpo shook himself crossly. You can't save them by going back. The thing to do is to go forward, find the proper princess, and marry her. No scroll magic takes effect for seven days, anyway. How do you know? asked Pompa anxiously. Read it in a witch book, answered Kabumpo promptly. Now that gives us plenty of time to go to the Emerald City and present ourselves to the lovely ruler of Oz. There's a proper princess for you, Pompa. But suppose she refuses me, said the prince uncertainly. You're very handsome, Pompa, my boy. The elegant elephant gave the prince a playful poke with his trunk. I've brought all my jewels as gifts, and the magic mirror, and doorknob as well. If she refuses you, and the worst comes to the worst, Kabumpo cleared his throat gravely. <clears throat> well, just leave it to me. After a bit more coaxing, and after eating the breakfast Kabumpo had thoughtfully brought along, Pompa allowed the elegant elephant to lift him on his head, and off they set at Kabumpo's best speed for the Emerald City of Oz. Neither the prince nor the elegant elephant had ever been out of Pumperdink, but Kabumpo had found an old map of Oz in the palace library. According to this map, the Emerald City lay directly to the south of their own country. So all we have to do is keep going south, chuckled Kabumpo softly. Pompadour nodded, but he was trying to recall the exact words of the mysterious scroll. Know ye that unless ye, prince of ye ancient and honorable kingdom of Pumperdink, shall wed ye proper fairy princess in ye proper span of time, ye kingdom of Pumperdink shall disappear forever, and even longer from ye Gillikin country of Oz. J. G. Pompadour repeated the words solemnly, then fell a-thinking of all he had heard of Ozma of Oz, the loveliest little fairy imaginable. She wouldn't want one of her kingdom to disappear, reflected Pompadour sagely. Now, as it happened, Ozma did not even know of the existence of Pumperdink. Oz is so large and inhabited by so many strange and singular peoples that although fourteen books of history have been written about it, only half the story has been told. There are no Oz railway or steamship lines, and traveling is tedious and slow, 
owing to the magic nature of the land itself its many mountains and fairy forests so that pumperdink like many of the small kingdoms on the outskirts of oz has never been explored by ozma oz itself is a huge oblong country divided into four parts the north being the purple gillikin country the east the blue munchkin country the south the red lands of the quadlings and the west the pleasant yellow country of the winkies in the very center of oz as almost every boy and girl knows is the wonderful emerald city and in its gorgeous green palace lives ozma the lovely little fairy princess whom kabumpo wanted pompadour to marry do you know mused the prince after they had traveled some time through the dim forest i believe that gold mirror has a lot to do with all this i believe it was put in the cake to help me find the proper princess hm, where would you find a more proper princess than ozma puffed kabumpo indignantly ozma is the one depend upon it just the same said pompa firmly i'm going to try every princess we meet do you expect to find him running wild in the woods snorted kabumpo who didn't like to be contradicted you never can tell the prince of pumperdink settled back comfortably now that they were really started he was finding traveling extremely interesting i should have done this long ago murmured the prince to himself every prince should go on a journey of adventure how long will it take us to reach the emerald city he asked presently two days if nothing happens answered kabumpo say what's that he stopped short and spread his ears till they looked like sails the underbrush at the right was crackling from the springs of some large animal and next minute a hoarse voice roared i want to know the which and what the where and how and why a curious luxurious old cottabus am i i want to know the when and who the what for and why so sir so please attend there is no end to things i want to know sir aha exulted the voice triumphantly there you are and a great round head was thrust out almost in kabumpo's face oh i'm going to enjoy this don't move kabumpo was too astonished to move and the next instant the cottabus had flounced out of the bushes and settled itself directly in front of the two travelers it was large as a pony but shaped like a great overfed cat its eyes bulged unpleasantly and the end of its tail ended in a large fan well grunted kabumpo after the strange creature had regarded them for a full minute without blinking well what it asked beginning to fan itself sulkily you act as if you had never seen a cottabus before we never have admitted pompa peering over kabumpo's head and secretly wishing he had brought along his jeweled sword why haven't you asked the cottabus rolling up its eyes how frightfully ignorant it closed its fan tail with a snap and looked up at them disapprovingly will you kindly tell me who you are where you are from when you came what you are going for how you are going to get it why you are going and what you are going to do when you do get it i don't see why we should tell you all that grumbled kabumpo it's none of your affair wrong shrieked the creature hysterically it is the business of a cottabus to find out everything i live on other people's affairs and unless here it paused took a large handkerchief out of a pocket in its fur and began to wipe its eyes unless a cottabus asks fifty questions a day it curls up in its porch rocker and d -d dies and this is my fifth questionless day hmm, curl up and die then said kabumpo gruffly but the kind-hearted prince felt sorry for the foolish creature 
If we answer your questions, will you answer ours? I'll try, sniffed the curious Cottabus, and, leaning over, it dragged a rocking chair out of the bushes and seated itself comfortably. Well, then, began Pompa, this is the elegant elephant, and I am a prince. We came from Pumperdink because our kingdom was threatened with disappearance unless I marry a proper princess. Yes, murmured the Cottabus, rocking violently. Yes, yes. And we are going to the Emerald City to ask Princess Ozma for her hand, continued the prince. How do you know she is the one? When did this happen? Who brought the message? What are you going to do if Ozma refuses you? asked the Cottabus, leaning forward breathlessly. Are you going to stand talking to this ridiculous creature all day? grumbled Kabumpo. But Pompadour, perhaps because he was so young, felt flattered that even a curious old Cottabus should take such an interest in his affairs. So, beginning at the very beginning, he told the whole story of his birthday party. Yes, yes, gulped the Cottabus wildly every time the prince paused for breath. Yes, yes, fluttering its fan excitedly. When Pompadour had finished, the Cottabus leaned back, closed its eyes, and put both paws on the arms of the rocker. I never heard anything more curious in all my life, said the curious one. This will keep me amused for three days. Of course, that's what we're here for, to amuse you, said Kabumpo scornfully. Let's be going, Pompa. Perhaps the curious Cottabus can tell us something of the country ahead. Are there any princesses living round here? the prince asked eagerly. Never heard of any, said the Cottabus, opening its eyes. Can you multiply, add, divide, and subtract? Are you good at fractions, prince? Not very, admitted Pompadour, looking mystified. Then you won't make much headway, sighed the Cottabus, shaking its head solemnly. Now, don't ask me why, it added lugubriously, dragging its rocker back into the brush. And while Kabumpo and Papa stared in amazement, it wriggled away into the bushes. Come on, said Kabumpo with a contemptuous grunt, but he had only gone a few steps, when the curious Cottabus stuck its head out of an opening in the trees just ahead. When are you coming back? it asked, twitching its nose anxiously. Never, trumpeted Kabumpo, increasing his speed. Again the Cottabus disappeared, only to reappear at the first turn in the road. Did you say the doorknob hit you on the head? it asked pleadingly. Kabumpo gave a snort of anger and rushed along so fast that Pompa had to hang on for dear life. Guess we've left him behind this time, spluttered the elegant elephant, after he had run almost a mile. But at that minute, there was a wheeze from the underbrush, and the head of the cottabus was thrust out. Its tongue was hanging out, and it was panting with exhaustion. How old are you? it gasped, rolling its eyes painfully. Who was your grandfather on your father's side, and was he bald? Carumpity Bumpus, raged the elegant elephant, flouncing to the other side of the road. But why was the doorknob in the cake? gulped the Cottabus, two tears trickling off its nose. How should we know? said Pompa coldly. Then just tell me the date of your birth, wailed the Cottabus, two tears trickling off its nose. No, no, screamed Kabumpo. And this time he ran so fast that the tearful voice of the Cottabus became fainter and fainter and finally died away altogether. Provokinest creature I've ever met, grumbled the elegant elephant, and this time Papa agreed with him. Isn't it almost lunchtime? asked the prince. He was beginning to feel terribly hungry. Aren't there any villages or cities between here and the Emerald City? Papa spoke again. Don't know, wheezed Kabumpo, swinging ahead. 
Oh, there's a flag, cried Pompa suddenly. It's flying above the treetops just ahead. And so it was. A huge flapping black flag covered with hundreds of figures and signs. Hurry up, Kabumpo, urged the prince. This looks interesting. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Kabumpo in Oz by Ruth Plubby Thompson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The City of the Figureheads. It reminds me of something disagreeable," answered Kabumpo as he eyed the flag. Nevertheless, he quickened his steps, and in a moment they came to a clearing in the forest surrounded by a tall black picket fence the only thing visible above the fence was the strange black flag and as the forest on either side was too dense to penetrate and there seemed to be no way around kabumpo thumped loudly on the center gate it was flung open at once so suddenly that kabumpo who had his head pressed against the bars fell on his knees and shot pompadour clear over his head Altogether, it was a very undignified entrance. "'Oh, oh, now we shall have some fun!' screamed a high, thin voice, and immediately the cry was taken up by hundreds of other voices. A perfect swarm of strange creatures surrounded the two travelers. The elegant elephant took one look, put back his ears, and snatched Pompa from the paving stones. "'Stop that!' he rumbled threateningly who are you anyway the crowd paid no attention to the elegant elephant's question but continued to dance up and down and scream with glee clutching kabumpo's ear pompa peered down with many misgivings they were entirely surrounded by thin spry little people who had figures instead of heads and the fours eights sevens and ciphers bobbing up and down made it terribly confusing let's go said pompa who was growing dizzier every minute but the figureheads were wedged so closely around them kabumpo could not move and they were shouting so lustily that the elegant elephant's voice was drowned in the hubbub finally kabumpo's eyes began to snap angrily and taking a deep breath he threw up his trunk and trumpeted like fifty ferryboat whistles the effect was immediate and astonishing half of the figureheads fell on their faces and the other half fell on their backs and stared vacantly up at the sky conduct us to your ruler roared kabumpo in the dead silence that followed how'd you know we had a ruler asked a seven getting cautiously to its feet most countries have said the elegant elephant shortly he's got no right to order us around said a six sitting up and jerking its thumb at kabumpo yes but seven frowned at six and put his hands over his ears this way he said gruffly and kabumpo stepping carefully for many of the figureheads were still on their backs followed seven if the inhabitants of this strange city were queer their city was even more so the air was dry and choky and the houses were dull oblong affairs set in rows and rows with never a garden in sight each street had a large signpost on the corner but they were not like the signs one usually sees in cities for these were plus and minus signs with here and there a long division sign i suppose everything in this streets divided up mumbled pompadour looking up at a division sign curiously hope they don't subtract any of our belongings whispered kabumpo as they turned into minus alley look pompa at the houses ever see anything like em before they remind me of something disagreeable mused the prince why they're books kabumpo great big arithmetic books pompa pointed at one 
You mean they are shaped like books, said the elegant elephant. I never saw books with windows and doors. A lot you know, said Seven, looking back scornfully. But Kabumpo was too interested to care. Out of the windows of the big book houses leaped hundreds of the little figureheads, and they laughed and jeered at Pompa and Kabumpo. Ho, ho! yelled one, leaning out so far it nearly fell on its eight. Wait till the Count sees him. He'll make an example of him. What an awful country, whispered Pompadour, ducking just in time as a four snatched at his hair from an open window. But just then they turned a corner and entered a large gloomy court. Sitting on a square and solid wood throne, surrounded by a guard of figureheads, sat the giant ruler of this strange city. "'What have you got there, Seven? roared the ruler. "'I am the elegant elephant, and this is the Prince of Pumperdink,' announced Kabumpo before Seven could answer. Pompadour himself could say nothing, for he had never before been addressed by a wooden ruler in his life. And that is exactly what the king of the figureheads was. An ordinary school ruler, twice as large as a man, with arms and legs and a great square head, set atop of his thin, flat body. "'I don't care a rap who you are. I want to know what you are.' said the ruler we are travelers spoke up pompa swallowing hard travelers in search of a proper princess well you won't find any here grunted the ruler shortly we don't believe in em would you mind telling me the name of your kingdom asked pompa somewhat cast down by these words you have no heads announced the ruler calmly or you would have known that this is rithmetic i he hammered himself upon the wooden chest i am its ruler and every inch a king king of the figureheads he added glaring around as if he expected someone to contradict him all right all right wheezed kabumpo bowing his head twice i knew twelve inches make a foot rule but I never knew they made a king rule. But could you give us some luncheon and allow us to pass peaceably through your kingdom? Pass through? exclaimed the king, standing up indignantly. We don't pass anyone through here. You've got to work your way through. Pass through, indeed. And when you've worked your way through, we'll put you in a problem and make an example of you. They'll make a very good example, your majesty, said a tall, thin individual standing next to the ruler. He eyed the two cunningly. If a thin prince sets out on a fat elephant to find a proper princess, how many yards of fringe will the elephant lose from his robe, and how bald will the prince be at the end of the journey? I don't believe anyone could figure that out, he murmured gleefully. It might be done by subtraction, said the king, looking at the two critically. Great haystacks, rumbled Kabumpo, glaring over his shoulder to see if he had lost any fringe so far. What have we gotten into? Bald? gulped Pompa, rubbing his head. Do you mean to say you take poor innocent travelers and make them into arithmetic problems? Why not? said the thin one who looked exactly like a giant lead pencil. And please address me as Count after this. Count it up is my name. What's the matter with living in a problem, my boy? Life is a problem, after all, and you will get used to it in time. I'll try to assign you to a comfortable book, and you'll find bookkeeping a lot more simple than housekeeping. This way, please. Please go, yawned the ruler, waving his hand. The Count will take you in charge now. And so dazed was the elegant elephant by all this strange reasoning that he tamely followed the lead pencil person. Goodbye, shouted the ruler hoarsely. Start them on simple additions, he said as they moved off. 
The street ahead was filled with figureheads, and as Kabumpo passed, they began forming themselves into sums. The first row sat down, the next knelt behind them, the third stood up, the fourth nimbly leaped upon the shoulders of the third, and so on, until a long addition confronted the travelers. Now, said Counted Up in his blunt way, as you haven't figures for heads, let us see if you have heads for figures. Kabumpo pushed back his pearl headdress, and drops of perspiration began to run down his trunk. Prince Pompa, lying flat on Kabumpo's head, started to add up the first line of figures. Eighty-three, he announced anxiously. Say three and eight to carry, snapped Counted Up. Here, three. A three stepped out of the crowd and placed itself under the line. I've got to be carried cried eight looking sulkily at pompa carried snorted kabumpo snatching eight into the air well i'll attend to you you do the adding pompa and i'll do the carrying he landed the eight head down at the bottom of the line of figureheads and swung his trunk carelessly while he waited for his next victim so slowly and painfully Pompa counted up the long lines, and Kabumpo carried, and if they made the slightest mistake, the figureheads shouted with scorn and danced about till the confusion was terrible. When an example was finished, the figureheads in it marched away, but another would immediately form lines ahead, so that it took them a whole hour to go two blocks. Oh, groaned Pompa at last. We'll never get through this, Kabumpo. Look at those awful fractions ahead. Can't I skip fractions? He asked, looking pleadingly at Count It Up. Certainly not, said the pencily man, stroking his shiny hair, which was straight and black and grew up into a sharp point. You shall skip nothing. That gives me an idea, whispered Kabumpo huskily. Why shouldn't we skip altogether? We're bigger than they are. Why, how are you getting on? At the sound of that hoarse, familiar voice, both the prince and Kabumpo jumped. You don't mind me asking, I hope. Clinging to the high picket fence and looking anxiously through the bars was the curious Cottabus. Have you found the greatest common divisor yet? Who's he? asked the elegant elephant suspiciously isn't there any way out of arithmetic but this wailed pompa looking at the cottabus pleadingly he was too tired to mind being questioned the curious beast was delighted to have this new opportunity to talk to the travelers will you answer a few questions if i tell you asked the cottabus raising itself with great difficulty and looking over the palings Yes, yes, anything, promised Pompa. Do you care for strawberry tarts? asked the Cottabus, twitching its nose very rapidly. Of course, said the Prince. Oh, do hurry. Count it up, we'll be back in a moment. He had run ahead to arrange a new problem, and the rest of the figureheads paid no attention to the queer creature clinging to the palings. Are you going to invite the Scarecrow to your wedding? gulped the Cottabus. I don't know any scarecrow, said Pompa. So how could I are you fond of that old elephant? the Cottabus waved at Kabumpo, who stamped first one foot, then another, and fairly snorted with rage. All right, sighed the curious Cottabus. That makes my fifty questions. Hanging on to the fence with one paw, it waved the other backward and forward as it chanted. How many ticks in arithmetic? Tell me that and tell me quick. But if you can't, it's not my fault, so simply turn a winter salt. The head of the cottabus disappeared. Now, isn't that provoking? gulped the prince. After it promised to help us, too. I meant somersault, wheezed the cottabus, reappearing suddenly. And if you can't, it's not your fault, so simply turn a somersault. It recited dolefully, and losing its balance, fell off the fence and landed with a thud on the ground below. 
Here, hurry along, scolded Count It Up, prodding Kabumpo with a sharp pencil. The next is a nice little problem in fractions. I wonder if it meant anything, mused Pompadour, as Kabumpo approached the new problem. If you can't, it's not your fault, so simply turn a somersault. Anyway, it won't hurt us to try. Stop a minute, Kabumpo. Sliding down the elegant elephant's trunk, the prince put his head on the ground and very carefully and deliberately turned a somersault. At his first motion, Count It Up gave a deafening scream, fell on his head, and broke off his point, while the figureheads began to run in every direction. Do it again, do it again, cried Kabumpo joyfully. So Pompa turned another somersault, and another, and another, and another, till not a figurehead was in sight. Even the figureheads at the windows of the houses tumbled out and dashed madly around the corner. Before they could return, Kabumpo snatched up Pompa and tore through the deserted streets of Rithmetic till he came to the black iron gate at the other end of the city. Butting it open with his head, the elegant elephant dashed through and never stopped running till he was miles away from there. Oh, have to rest a bit and eat some leaves, puffed Kabumpo, at last slowing down. Phew! Wish I could eat leaves, sighed the prince, as Kabumpo began lunching off the treetops. But never mind, we're out of arithmetic. Wasn't it lucky that Cotabus followed us? I never would have thought of getting out of sums by turning somersaults, would you? Only sensible thing I'd ever said, probably answered the elegant elephant with his mouth full of leaves there's a lot more to be learned by traveling than by studying my boy somersaults for sums let's always remember that pompa did not answer he slid down kabumpo's trunk and began hunting anxiously around for something to eat not far away he found a large nut tree and gathering a handful of nuts he sat down and began to crack them on a white marble slab nearby. Next instant, Kabumpo heard a thud and a muffled cry. The Prince of Pumperdink had vanished as if by magic. "'Where are you?' screamed the elegant elephant, pounding through the brush. "'Pompa! Pompa! He's disappeared!' gasped Kabumpo, rushing over to the marble slab. There was not a sign of the royal prince of Pumperdink anywhere, but carved carefully on the white stone were these words. Please knock before you fall in. Fall in, snorted Kabumpo, his eyes rolling wildly. Great gooch! End of chapter 5《ชั่วโมงของกบุมพ์เวนัสของรูธพลัมมี่ทอมสันนี่คือเพลงของการร้องเพลงที่มีชื่อเสียงในในชั่วโมงชั่วโมงรูเกโร่ในชีวิตในสิบรัก On the same night that Prince Pompa and Kabumpo had disappeared from Pumperdink, a little gray gnome crouched in a deep chamber tunneled under the Emerald City. laboriously carving letters on a big rock it was ruggedo the old gnome king carving and grumbling and grumbling and carving and pausing every few minutes to light his pipe with a hot coal which he kept in his pocket for that purpose a big emerald lamp cast a green glow over the strange cavern and made the gnome look like a bad green goblin which he was wag screamed the gnome suddenly throwing down his chisel where are you you long-eared villain there was a slight stir at the back of the cave and a rabbit of about the same size as the gnome shuffled slowly forward what do you want he asked rubbing one eye with his paw bring me a cup of melted mud idiot roared the gnome pounding on the rock and serve it to me on my throne at once now see here the rabbit twitched his nose rapidly i'll get you a cup of melted mud but don't you call me an idiot 
I don't mind working for one, nor digging for one, and listening to his foolishness. But nobody can call me an idiot, not even a make-believe king. Oh, you make me tired, fumed the gnome. Then go to sleep, advised the rabbit with a yawn. What's the use of trying to pretend you're a king, Rug? Ho, ho, king over one wooden doll, six rocks, and twenty-seven sofa cushions. You may have been a king once, but now you're just a plain gnome and nothing else. And if you go and sit quietly in your plain rocking chair, I'll bring you a cup of plain mud. With a chuckle, the rabbit retired, and Ruggero, sputtering with fury, flounced into a doll's broken rocker that was set in the exact center of the cave. Here I give that rabbit everything I steal, and he won't even allow me the little luxury of calling him an idiot or of pulling his ears. How can I pretend to be a king without an ear to pull? grumbled the gnome. What are you grinning at? Bouncing out of his chair, Ruggedo flew at a merry-faced wooden doll, who sat propped up against the wall and shook her till her head turned round backwards and her arms and legs flew every which way. Then he hurled her violently into a corner. Quite out of breath, he sank back in his chair and stared angrily about. When Wag returned, the gnome snatched the tin cup of melted mud and tossed it down with one gulp. Then, flinging the cup at the doll, he went back to work. The rabbit shook his head mournfully, and, picking up the wooden doll, straightened her out and placed her on a cushion. Then, yawning again, he lit a candle and started for the passage at the back of the cave. "'How are you getting on?' he asked, pausing to look over the gnome's shoulder with a grin. "'Fine,' answered Ruggero, forgetting to scowl. "'I'm up to the sixth rock and expect to finish tonight.' "'Who do you think will read it?' asked the rabbit, putting back both ears and stroking his whiskers. Then he gave a great spring, just escaped the chisel Ruggedo had flung at his head, and pattered away into the darkness. For several minutes the gnome danced up and down with fury. Then, as there was no one to pinch or shake, he started to work harder than ever on the sixth rock of his history. There were six of the great stones set in a row on one side of the cavern, and the carving on them had taken the old gnome king the best part of two years. The letters were crooked and roughly chiseled, but quite readable. On the first rock he had carved. History of Ruggero in Six Rocks Ruggero the Rough, King of the Gnomes one time metal monarch, at other times a lemoniag, a goose, a nut, and now a common gnome by order of Ozma of Oz. The second rock told of Ruggedo's magnificent kingdom under the mountains of Ev, of the thousands of gnomes he had ruled, and the great treasure of precious gems he had possessed in those good old days before he was banished from his dominions. The third rock told of his transformation of the Queen of Ev and her children into ornaments for his palace, and of their rescue by a party from Oz through the cleverness of Bellina, a yellow hen. It told of the loss of his magic belt, which was captured at the same time by Dorothy, a little girl from Kansas. The fourth rock related how Ruggedo had tried to conquer Oz and recover his belt, how all his plans failed, and how he tumbled into the Fountain of Oblivion and forgot all about his campaign. The fifth rock had taken Ruggedo the longest to carve, for it gave the story of his banishment by the great Jin Titihuchu. You have probably read this story yourself. How Tick-Tock, Betsy Bobbin, Shaggy Man, and Polychrome, trying to find Shaggy's brother, hidden in the Gnome King's metal forest, were thrown down a long tube to the other side of the world, and how the owner of the tube sent Quox the dragon to punish Ruggedo by banishment from his kingdom, and how Calico was made king of the gnomes. 
the sixth rock told of Ruggedo's last attempt to capture Oz. Meeting Kiki Aru, a high-up boy who knew a magic transformation word, Ruggedo suggested that they change themselves to Limoneegs, queer beasts with lion heads, monkey tails, and eagle wings. Get all the beasts of Oz to help and march on the Emerald City. But this plan failed too. Kiki lost his temper and changed Ruggedo to a goose. The Wizard of Oz discovered the magic word and changed both the conspirators to nuts. Later on they were changed back to their normal shapes, but again Ruggedo was plunged into the Fountain of Oblivion and again forgot his wicked plans. This ended the rock history except for a short sentence stating that Ruggedo now lived in the Emerald City. But the magic of the Fountain of Oblivion had soon worn off, and it was not long before Ruggedo began to remember his past wickedness. That is how he decided to carve his life story in rock, so that it would be handy should he ever fall into the forgetful fountain again. And it had taken six rocks to tell all of his adventures. He had not carved these stories just as they had happened, nor ever called himself wicked, but he had told most of the facts, leaving out the parts most unflattering to himself. And now it was all finished, his whole history in six rocks. Throwing down his chisel for the last time, Ruggedo straightened up and regarded his work with glowing pride. I don't believe there's another history like this in all Oz, puffed the gnome, tugging at his silver beard. It's a good thing, chuckled Wag, who had come back to eat a carrot. Oz would not be a very happy place if there were many folks like you. He seated himself quietly on the first rock of Ruggedo's history and began nibbling his carrot. Get up! How dare you sit on my history! Ruggedo stamped his foot and started threateningly toward Wag. All right, said the rabbit. It's too hard anyway. Of course it's hard, stormed Ruggedo. I've had a hard life, hard as those rocks. Everyone's been against me from the very start, and all because I'm so little, he finished bitterly. No, because you are so wicked, said the rabbit calmly. Now don't throw your pipe at me, for you know it's the truth. Ruggedo glared at the rabbit for a minute, then rushed over to the wooden doll and began shaking her furiously. He always vented his rage on the wooden doll. Stop that, screamed Wag, or I'll leave upon the spot. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, you old scrabble scratch. She's not alive snapped Ruggedo sulkily. "'How do you know?' retorted the rabbit. "'Anyway, she's a jolly creature. I'm not going to have her banged around. Here you've taken her away from her little mother, and she hasn't even anyone to rock her to sleep.' "'I'll rock her to sleep,' screamed Ruggedo maliciously, and, flinging the doll on the floor, he began hurling small rocks at the helpless little figure. Scrambling to his feet, Wag rescued the wooden doll again, and Ruggedo, who really was afraid the rabbit would leave him, subsided into his rocking chair. Then, reaching up to a small shelf over his head, he pulled down an accordion. At the first doleful wheeze, Wag gave a great hop, dropped Peg, and disappeared into his room in the farthest corner of the cave. After his last attempt to capture Oz, the gnome had been given a small cottage to live in just outside the Emerald City. But Ruggedo could not bear life above ground. The sunlight hurt his eyes, and the contented, happy faces of the people hurt his feelings. For he was exactly what Wag had called him, an old Scrabble Scratch. So while he pretended to live in the little cottage, According to Ozma's orders, he really spent most of his time in this deep, dark cave, 
he entered it by a secret passage opening from his cellar digging the long passage had been the hardest work ruggedo had ever done in his bad little life while toiling one day he had bumped into the underground burrow of wag a wandering rabbit of oz and after a deal of bargaining the rabbit had agreed to help him wag was to receive a ruby a month for his services for the gnome still had a large bag of precious stones which he had brought from the old kingdom after the bargain with wag was made the passage progressed rapidly for the rabbit was an expert digger it was ruggedo's idea to tunnel himself out a secret chamber directly under ozma's palace and there establish a kingdom of his own but when they had almost reached the spot the earth began to crumble away and a few strokes of ruggedo's spade revealed a great dark cavern already tunneled by someone else it was huge and the exact shape of the royal palace this ruggedo discovered by careful measurement and also that it was directly beneath the gorgeous green edifice so that the footsteps of the servants could be heard faintly pattering to and fro this dark underground retreat suited the former gnome king exactly and without stopping to wonder to whom it had belonged ruggedo gleefully took possession for almost two years he had lived here without anyone suspecting it but so far his kingdom had not progressed very well wag had tried to coax some of his rabbit relatives to serve the old gnome as subjects but ruggedo besides his terrible temper had a mean habit of pulling their ears so that the whole crew had deserted the first week he had pulled wag's ears once but the rabbit tore out a pawful of his whiskers and bit him so severely in the leg that ruggedo had never dared to try it again wag had stayed partly because ruggedo amused him and partly because of the bribes for every day in fear of losing his only retainer ruggedo brought wag something from the emerald city something he has stolen in return wag waited on the bad little gnome and listened to his grumblings against everybody in oz all the furnishings of this strange cave had been stolen from various houses in the emerald city the twenty-seven brocade cushions had been taken one at a time from the palace the green emerald lamp also every day ruggedo ran innocently about the city pretending to visit this one and that and every day cups spoons and candlesticks disappeared the doll's rocker which ruggedo insisted upon calling his throne had been taken from betsy bobbin a little girl who lived with ozma in the palace he had lugged it through the secret passage with great difficulty the wooden doll had been stolen from trot another of ozma's companions she was trot's favorite doll for she had been carved out of wood by captain bill an old one-legged sailor who was one of the most celebrated characters in all oz he had carved her for trot one day when they were on a picnic in the winkie country from the wood of a small yellow tree and as captain bill had old-fashioned notions peg was a very old-fashioned doll but she had splendid joints and could sit down and stand up her face was painted and as pleasant as a laughing blue eyes a turned-up nose and a smiling mouth could make it trot had dressed her in a funny old-fashioned dress with pantalettes and then thinking peg too short a name the little girl had added amy because she was so amiable she confided laughingly to the old sailor captain bill had wagged his head understandingly and peg amy had straightway become the most popular doll in the palace that is until she disappeared for ruggedo had found her one day in the garden and chuckling wickedly had carried her off to his cave how trot would have felt if she had seen her poor doll being shaken and scolded by the old gnome king but trot never knew 
she hunted and hunted for her doll and finally gave up in despair fortunately peg was well made or she would have been shaken to bits but her joints held bravely and nothing not even the terrible scolding of the bad old gnome could change her pleasant expression being the sole subject of so wicked a king however was wearing even for a wooden doll and peg was beginning to show signs of wear her nose was badly chipped one pantalette was missing and both sleeves had been jerked from her dress by the furious old gnome if the rabbit was around ruggedo did not shake peg as hard as he wanted to but when the rabbit was gone he pretended she was his old steward Calico, and scolded and flung her about to his heart's content when not carving his history or shaking peg ruggedo had spent most of his time digging new tunnels and chambers so that leading off from the main cavern was a perfect network of underground passages in the back of ruggedo's head was a notion that some day he would conquer the emerald city regain his magic powers and then after changing all the inhabitants to moldy muffins return to his dominions and oust Coleco from his throne just how this was to be done he had not decided but the secret passages would be useful so meanwhile he dug secret passages above ground the little rascal went about so meekly and pretended to be so delighted with his life among the inhabitants of the emerald city that ozma really thought he had reformed wag to whom he confided his plans would shake his head gloomily and often plan to leave the services of the wicked old gnome there was no real harm in wag but the rabbit had a weakness for collecting and the spoons cups and odds and ends that ruggedo brought him from the emerald city filled him with delight he felt that they were not gotten honestly but his work for ruggedo was honest and hard and it's not my fault if the old scrabble scratch steals em wag would mumble to himself in his heart he knew that he was doing wrong to stay with ruggedo but like all foolish creatures he could not make up his mind to go so this very night while the old gnome sat playing the accordion and howling doleful snatches of the gnome national air wag was gloating over his treasures they quite filled his little dugout room there were two emerald plates a gold pencil a dozen china cups and saucers twenty thimbles stolen from the work baskets of the good dames of oz scraps of silk pictures and almost everything you could imagine i'll soon have enough to marry and go to housekeeping on murmured the rabbit clasping his paws and twitching his nose very fast he picked up a pair of purple wool socks that had once belonged to a little girl's doll and regarded them rapturously out of all the articles ruggedo had given him wag considered these purple socks the most valuable perhaps because they exactly fitted him and were the only things he could really use the squeaking of the accordion stopped at last and supposing his wicked little master had retired for the night wag prepared to enjoy himself draping a green silk scarf over his shoulders he strutted before the mirror pretending he was a courtier of oz then throwing down the scarf he sat down on the floor and had just drawn on one of the socks when a loud shrill scream from ruggedo made his ear stand straight on end in amazement oh what now coughed the rabbit seizing the candle ruggedo was on his knees before the rocking chair as i was sitting here playing and singing sputtered the old gnome i noticed a little ring in one of the rocks on the floor well what of it sniffed wag leaning down to pull up his sock what of it shrieked the gnome what of it you poor puny earthworm look leaning over ruggedo's shoulder and dropping hot candle grease down the gnome's neck 
Wag peered into a square opening in the floor. There lay a small gold box. Studded in gems on the lid were these words. Glegg's Box of Mixed Magic. M mixed magic stuttered wag dropping the candle oh my socks and soup spoons ruggedo said nothing but his little red eyes blazed maliciously reaching down he lifted out the box and clasping it to his fat little stomach shook his fist at the high domed ceiling of the cave now hissed ruggedo triumphantly now we shall see what mixed magic will do to the emerald city of oz end of chapter 6 chapter 7 of kabumpo in oz by ruth plummy thompson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 7 sir hokus and the giants oh sighed sir hokus of pokes and oz stretching his armored legs to the fire how i yearn to slay a giant how it would refresh me hast any real giants in oz dorothy don't you remember the candy giant laughed the little girl looking up from the handkerchief she was making for ozma not to my taste said the knight though his vest buttons were vastly nourishing well there's mr Yoop. he's a real blood and bone giant there are plenty of giants i guess if we just knew where to find them said the little girl biting off her thread find em bind em get up behind em hocus pocus he don't mind em screamed the patchwork girl bounding out of her chair but why can't you stay peaceably at home old ironsides and be jolly like the rest of us you don't understand scraps put in dorothy gravely sir hokus is a knight and it is a true knight's duty to slay giants and dragons and go on quests that's it my lady patches boomed sir hokus puffing out his chest i've rusted here in idleness long enough Tomorrow, with Ozma's permission, I shall start on a giant quest. I'd go with you, only I've promised to help Ozma count the royal emeralds, said the scarecrow, who had ridden over from his corn ear residence to spend a week with his old friends in the Emerald City. Giants, sir, are bluff and rude, and might mistake a man for food. Hocus pocus, be discreet, or you will soon be giant meat, chuckled the patchwork girl crooking her finger under the knight's nose <laughs> nonsense blustered sir hokus waving scraps aside rising from his green armchair he strode up and down the room his armor clanking at every step straight away the company began to tell about wild giants they had read of or known trot and betsy bobbin held hands as they sat together on the sofa and toto dorothy's small dog crept closer to his little mistress the bristles on his back rising higher as each story was finished giant stories are all very well but why tell em at night shivered toto peering nervously at the long shadows in the corners of the room it was the evening after ruggedo's strange discovery of the mixed magic and in the royal palace ozma and most of the courtiers had retired but a few of princess dorothy's special friends had gathered in the cozy sitting-room of her apartment to talk about old times they were very unusual and interesting friends not at all the sort one would expect to find in a royal palace even in fairyland dorothy herself before she had become a princess of oz had been a little girl from kansas but after several visits to this delightful country she had preferred to make Oz her home. Trot and Betsy Bobbin also had come from the United States by way of shipwrecks, so to speak, and had been invited to remain by Ozma, the little fairy princess who ruled Oz, and now each of these girls had a cozy little apartment in the royal palace. 
Toto had come with Dorothy, but the rest of the company were of more or less magic extraction. The Scarecrow, a stuffed straw person, with a marvelous set of mixed brains given to him by the Wizard of Oz, was Dorothy's favorite. In fact, she had discovered him herself upon a munchkin farm, lifted him down from his bean pole, and brought him to the Emerald City. Tick-Tock was a wonderful man made entirely of copper, who could talk, think, and act as well as the next fellow when properly wound. You would have been amazed to hear the giant story he was ticking off at this very minute. As for Scraps, she had been made by a magician's wife out of old pieces of patchwork and magically brought to life. Her bright patches, yarn hair, and silver suspender button eyes gave Scraps so comical an expression that just to look at her tickled one's funny bone. Her head was full of nonsense rhymes, and she was so amusing and cheerful that Ozma insisted upon her living with the rest of the celebrities in the Emerald City. Sir Hocus of Pokes was a comparative newcomer in the capital city of Oz, yet the night was so old that it would give me lumbago just to try to count up his birthdays. He dated back to King Arthur, in fact, and had been wished into the land of Oz centuries before by an enemy sorcerer. Dorothy had found and rescued him, with the cowardly lion's help, from Pokes, the dullest kingdom in Oz. As there were no other knights in the Emerald City, Sir Hocus was much stared at and admired. Even the soldier with the green whiskers, the one and only soldier and entire army of Oz, yes, even the soldier with the green whiskers saluted Sir Hocus when he passed. Ozma herself felt more secure since the knight had come to live in the palace. He was well versed in adventure and always courageous and courteous withal. But while I've been telling you all this, Tick-Tock had finished his story of a three-legged giant who lived in Ev. And where is Ev? puffed Sir Hocus, planting himself before Tick-Tock. Ev, began Tick-Tock in his precise fashion, is to the north-west of here, on the other side of the m There was a whirr and a click and the copper man stood motionless and soundless, his round eyes fixed solemnly on the night. Passable desert, finished the scarecrow, jumping up and kindly winding all of Tick-Tock's keys as if nothing had happened. Passable desert, continued the copper man. That's where the old gnome king used to live, piped Betsy Bobbin, bouncing up and down upon the sofa, under the mountains of Ev, and he threw us down a tube and tried to melt you in a crucible, didn't he, Tick-Tock? He was a very bad person, said the copper man. Ruggedo was a wicked king, though now he's good as pie. But nonetheless, I must confess, he has a wicked eye, burst out Scraps, who was tired of sitting still listening to giant stories. But Sir Hocus could not be got off the subject of giants. To Ev, thundered the knight, raising his sword. Tomorrow I'm off to Ev to conquer this terrible monster. Large as a mountain, you say, Tick-Tock? Well, what care I for mountains? I, Sir Hocus of Pokes, will slay him. Hurrah for the giant killer, giggled Scraps, turning a somersault and nearly falling in the fire. Let's go to bed, said Dorothy uneasily. She had, for the last few minutes, been hearing strange rumbles. Of course it could not be giants. Still the conversation, she concluded, had better be finished by sunlight. But it never was, for at that moment there was a deafening crash. The lights went out, the whole castle shivered, furniture fell every which way, down clattered Sir Hocus, falling with a terrible clangor on top of the copper man. Down rolled the little girls and the scarecrow and scraps. Down tumbled everybody. Cyclone! gasped Dorothy, who had experienced several in Kansas. Giants! 
stuttered Betsy Bobbin, clutching Trot. The Wizard of Oz tried to reassure the agitated company. He told them there was no cause for alarm, and that they would soon find out what was the trouble. The soothing words of the wizard were scarcely heard. What the others said was lost in the noise that followed. Thumps! bangs crashes screams came from every room in the rocking palace we're flying the whole castle's flying up in the air screamed dorothy then she subsided as an emerald clock and three pictures came thumping down on her head what had happened no one could say dorothy betsy bobbin and trot had fainted dead away the scarecrow and sir hokus were tangled up on the floor clasped in each other's arms the confusion was terrific only the wizard was still calm and smiling end of chapter 7「chapter 8 of kabumpo in oz by ruth plummy thompson this librivox recording is in the public domain Chapter Eight, Woe in the Emerald City. The soldier with the green whiskers finished his breakfast slowly, combed his beard, pinned on all of his medals, and solemnly issued forth from his little house at the garden gates. Forward, march! Snapped the soldier. He had to give himself orders, being the only man, general or private, in the army and forward march he did it was his custom to report to ozma every morning to receive his orders for the day when he had gone through the little patch of trees that separated his cottage from the palace the soldier with the green whiskers gave a great leap halt break ranks roared the grand army of oz clutching his beard in terror great galoshes he rubbed his eyes and looked again. Yes, the gorgeous emerald-studded palace had disappeared, leaving not so much as a gold brick to tell where it had stood. Trembling in every knee, the grand army of Oz approached. A great black hole, the exact shape of the palace, yawned at his feet. He took one look down that awful cavity then shot through the palace gardens like a green comet like paul revere he had gone to give the alarm and paul revere himself never made better time he thumped on windows and banged on doors and dashed through the sleeping city like a whirlwind in five minutes there was not a man woman or child who did not know of the terrible calamity they rushed to the palace gardens in a panic some stared up in the air others peered down the dark hole still others ran about wildly trying to discover some trace of the missing castle what shall we do they wailed dismally for to have their lovely little queen and the wizard and all the most important people in oz disappear at once was simply terrifying they were a gentle and kindly folk used to obeying orders and now there was no one to tell them what to do at last unc nunky an old munchkin who had taken up residence in the emerald city pushed through the crowd unc was a man of few words but a wise old chap for all that so they made way for him respectfully first unc nunky stroked his beard then pointing with his long lean finger toward the south he snapped out one word glinda of course they must tell glinda why had they not thought of it themselves glinda would know just what to do and how to do it three cheers for unc nunky glinda you know is the good sorceress of oz who knows more magic than anyone in the kingdom but who only practices it for the people's good indeed glinda and the wizard of oz are the only ones permitted to practice magic for so much harm had come of it that ozma made a law forbidding sorcery in all of its branches 
but even in a fairy country people do not always obey the laws and everyone felt that magic was at the bottom of this disaster so away to fetch glinda dashed the grand army his green whiskers streaming behind him fortunately the royal stables had not disappeared with the palace so the gallant army sprang upon the back of the sawhorse and without stopping to explain to the other royal beasts bade it carry him to glinda as fast as it could gallop being made of wood with gold-shod feet and magically brought to life the sawhorse can run faster than any animal in oz it never tired or needed food and when it understood that the palace and its dear little mistress had disappeared it fairly flew for the sawhorse loved ozma with all its sawdust and was devoted as only a wooden beast can be in an hour they had reached glinda's shining marble palace in the southern part of the quadling country and as soon as the lovely sorceress had heard the soldier's story she hurried to the magic book of records this is the most valuable book in oz and it is kept padlocked with many golden chains to a gold table for in this great volume appear all the events happening in and out of the world now glinda had been so occupied trying to discover the cause of frowns that she had not referred to the book for several days and naturally there were many pages to go over there were hundreds of entries concerning automobile accidents in the united states and elsewhere these glinda passed over hurriedly till she came to three sentences printed in red for oz news always appeared in the book in red letters the first sentence did not seem important it merely stated that the prince of pumperdink was journeying toward the emerald city the other two entries seemed serious glegg's box of mixed magic has been discovered said the second and ruggedo has something on his mind stated the third glinda pored over the book for a long time to see whether any more information would be given but not another red sentence appeared with a sigh glinda turned to the soldier with the green whiskers ah the old gnome king must be mixed up in this she said anxiously and as he was last seen in the emerald city i will return with you at once so glinda and the soldier with the green whiskers flew back to the emerald city drawn in glinda's chariot by swift flying swans and the little sawhorse trotted back by himself when they reached the gardens a great crowd had gathered by the fountain of oblivion and a tall greengrocer was speaking excitedly what is it asked glinda shuddering as she passed the dreadful hole where ozma's lovely palace had once stood everyone started explaining at once so that glinda was obliged to clap her hands for silence footprint unc nookie stood upon his tiptoes and whispered it in glinda's ear and when she looked where unc pointed she saw a huge shallow cave-in that crushed the flower beds for as far as she could see footprint gasped glinda in amazement uh-huh Unc Nunky wagged his head determinedly, and then, pulling his hat down over his eyes, spoke his last word on the subject. Giant! A giant footprint! Why, so it is! cried Glinda. What shall we do? What shall we do? cried the frightened inhabitants of the Emerald City, wringing their hands. First, find Ruggedo ordered glinda suddenly remembering the mysterious entry in the book of records so away to the little cottage hurried the crowd they searched it from cellar to garret but of course found no trace of the wicked little gnome as no one knew about the secret passage in ruggedo's cellar they never thought of searching underground meanwhile glinda sank down on one of the golden garden benches and tried to think the comfortable camel stumbled broken-heartedly across the lawn and dropping on its knees begged the sorceress in a tearful voice to save sir hokus of pokes 
The camel and the doubtful dromedary had been discovered by the knight on his last adventure and were deeply attached to him. Soon all the palace pets came and stood in a dejected row before Glinda, Betsy's mule, Hank, he hawing dismally, and the hungry tiger threatening to eat everyone in sight if any harm came to the three little girls. "'I doubt if we'll ever see them again,' groaned the doubtful dromedary, leaning up against a tree. "'Oh, Dowdy, how can you?' wailed the camel, tears streaming down its nose. "'Please do be quiet,' begged Glinda, "'or I'll forget all the magic I know. "'Let me see, now, how does one catch a marauding giant who has run off with a castle?' On her fingers, Glinda counted up all the giants in the four countries of Oz. No, it could not be an Oz giant. There was none large enough. It must be a giant from some strange country. When the crowd returned with the news that Ruggedo had disappeared, Glinda felt more uneasy still. But hiding her anxiety, she bade the people return to their homes and continue their work and play as usual. Then, promising to return that evening with a plan to save the castle, and charging the soldier with the green whiskers to keep a strict watch in the garden, Glinda stepped into her chariot and flew back to the south. All that day, in her palace in the Quadling country, Glinda bent over her encyclopedia on giants, and far into the night the lights burned from her high turret chamber as she consulted book after book of magic. End of chapter 8